Welcome to Miles Entertainment. My name is Jesse Milestone, and that is not the only person on your screen right here. We've got Richard Chu back again. Uh, hope you guys all enjoyed part one, where we learned all about how he became a filmmaker in the first place. Big leap out from Harvard Law, back to the West Coast to dive into documentary filmmaking. And we ended that uh, fascinating journey on our transition from documentary filmmaking into your very first feature film project. So first, before we dive into the heart, so how are you? How are you doing? How is life? How has the world treated you since last we spoke? Oh, you know, uh, because of COVID, uh, I've, <laughs> I've stayed home a lot, except for occasional trips out for groceries. And for these conversations with you, thank goodness, it allows me to have a little bit of a window to the outside world. Uh, since I really don't talk very much on the phone, uh, this provides me with uh, some content for my conversations other than complaints to, I don't know, neighbors or something. So it's go. really cool that uh, you give me this chance to uh, kind of uh, uh, reevaluate uh, my past in film. Well, I'm glad to give you the opportunity to do that because it's certainly it's certainly been incredibly exciting for me to get to discuss it with you. And you know, most of this is first obviously you lived it and have been ruminating over it for however many years. And for me and the audience, we're all experiencing some of these stories for the very first time. So it's it's a treat for both of us, uh, definitely. Uh, I'm going to say more for me, but I can't really can't necessarily argue that. I just like winning competitions, so. <laughs> so but without further ado, we're in you're in you're out, you know, making documentaries about the trees, making documentaries about uh making documentaries for the Peace Corps, and and somehow we end up connected to the conversation. I'll let you take it away from there, how that how that how we ended up from one to the other. Well, actually, um after the Peace Corps. Uh, in 1969, I, I got a call uh, to attend a rock festival uh, as a film cameraman. And it ended up, uh, it was going to be this small uh, rock festival in upstate New York. And by the time I got there and spent the weekend there, it got all blown up to be this huge rock festival called Woodstock. And that's how, you know, people refer to it now. And it's really gotten blown out of proportion because probably at that time when I was there for the four days, mm -hmm. um, it, there were uh, reported at that time 300,000 people thereabouts who attended over the weekend. But each decade, it added 10,000 people or <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people. So when you read about it now, there was like 600,000 people. <laughs> So you know how history it kind of blows things up, especially if it's kind of cool. But it was there that I met a, a cameraman named David Myers, uh, who was from San Francisco. Hmm. And he told me that I was looking for a way to uh, leave Seattle because Seattle is a small kind of film town. And yeah. I wasn't doing a lot of film work as uh, a cameraman or as an editor. So uh, David Myers, who actually in the film, if any of you have ever seen Woodstock, there's this great uh, sequence called the Portisan sequence where he filmed and interviewed a man that was cleaning out all the uh, Portisans, which are these uh, you know, portable toilets. And, uh, and that interview stood out because here's a man cleaning up the crap of all the attendees where his, while his son, was a soldier in Vietnam. Wow. So it kind of showed uh, in the film this great you know, juxtaposition of yeah. what people were doing on the home front and what people were doing you know, 10,000 miles away. Yeah. But David, um, in the course of that weekend, I, when I was asking him about San Francisco, because my last uh, desire was to go to Hollywood. <laughs> so I asked him, I said, what's going on in San Francisco? So he said, there are some a um, couple of young guys uh, that just settled in San Francisco. And this is in September of 1969 when I met him and we had this conversation. He said, there's this uh, guy named Francis Coppola who just came up from Hollywood. And there's this kid out of film school named uh, George, George Lucas. <laughs> I haven't met him yet, but 
there's this kid up there and there's just so there's a couple of young people there that are looking for you know collaborators uh so you might write them a letter and uh <laughs> you know and, and and see what's happening so yeah. i actually did I, I wrote three letters one to coppola one to lucas and to another filmmaker named john cordy oh who at God. that time was more well known in san francisco than the other two guys because cordy was a bay area native Mm -hmm. So uh, he was the only one that replied, yeah. and uh, uh, he was looking for an editor. Uh, that was also the years that the film, uh, the American Film Institute, had started, and Cordy had uh, a grant to do a film about this um, uh, famous American still photographer named Imogen Cunningham, mm -hmm. who that, by that time was in her late eighties, oh, wow. and uh, so uh, John Cordy was looking for an editor. Uh, to uh, put together his uh, the footage from that film. So that was what led me to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So in 1970, when I went to the, uh, the studio where he was working out of and kind of partnered with George Lucas and Francis Coppola at American Zoetrope yeah. in San Francisco, that was yeah. 1970. And it's, uh, it was you know uh, situated in a warehouse district south of Market in San Francisco, uh, kind of a rundown area, which of course now is high tech with multi-million dollar uh, I've, I've, and everything else. I've been to the cafe yeah. where they still have the cafe zoetrope now. <laughs> I yeah, went. well, at that time I was like, uh, <laughs> anyway, it was pretty rundown and kind of unsafe to be out at nighttime. Yeah. But uh, that was there that I, I got to um, meet George Lucas and Francis Coppola, and I edited documentaries out of there because uh you know feature film um production hadn't really got up to gear there yeah. so um uh, from working with cordy and then i edited some small documentaries that coppola was producing for the government for the federal government and um down the hall george lucas was uh editing thx 1138 with yeah. uh Walt Birch. And um, it was there that I got to meet those guys. And uh, I was still working in documentaries and occasionally taking some uh, gigs as a, a cameraman for producers from out of town. Yeah. Uh, and it was during the course of this time I got to know uh, Walter Murch, who in, uh, okay, then flash forwards a few years. Uh, so by this time, uh, George Lucas had filmed um, American Graffiti Mm -hmm. And um, while Marsha Lucas and Verna Fields were cutting it, um, uh, Walter was designing the soundtrack and sound mix and coming up with his innovative techniques of worldizing uh, uh, the music in the world of American graffiti. Yeah. And um, by that time, um, uh, uh, Francis Coppola, on the success of God, the first Godfather, uh, got funding from Paramount Studios to uh, to less than two million dollars to shoot this film based on a, a script that Coppola had written back in the '60s called The Conversation. And um, because of how the the, the timeline was working out, um, Walter Murch. Uh, asked me if I would put together the first cut of the conversation while he was uh, completing his work on um, American Graffiti. Wow. So for me, it was my first foray into feature films. God. Now, I was coming out of documentaries where, as I had mentioned previously, uh, most of which were shot cinema verite fashion. Mm -hmm. And the challenge in putting together those kinds of documentaries was to kind of um, put a linear uh, narrative to it because of how uh, scenes were shot, it was kind of haphazard to catch what was going on. So yeah. for me in working in those documentaries, it was trying to put a, uh, some sense into uh, imposing kind of a linear flow to the events and even within scenes yeah. um, to kind of put together some kind of continuity. Now, the conversation, uh, putting together a first cut 
usually means, and in that case, it certainly meant to follow the outlines of the script. Yeah. And the script laid it out really well. You know, scene A, this happens, this character says this, and this character says that. And for me, that was just wonderful to have a blueprint yeah. of how to tell a story, how to put together these images, because they were, you know, uh, staged and shot based on the script. So for me, it was a, 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 such a different exercise um, than working on Center of Verite documentaries from my past. Yeah. Well, in the course of the next year and a half, uh, because I started in November of 1972, uh, putting together the first cut, and we worked on it for a year and a half until like February of, uh, of 1974. And when Walter came in, he uh, was given the free reign by Coppola to re, um, uh, kind of reconfigure uh, mm -hmm. how to tell that story. Mm -hmm. And um, as any of you who have seen the picture, you can see that there are uh, flashbacks to the conversation, flash forwards. Well, not really flash forwards, but flashbacks yes. as to how Gene Hackman's character was imagining what was going on the, the, uh, behind what he had recorded on the tape. Mm -hmm. So that to me, in that year and a half, it was a further education for me who hadn't gone to film school, how mm -hmm. to tell a story. I didn't realize that the editor had the power uh, to change the flow of the story, what was revealed when. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was like mind boggling because I, because up to that time, I, I mean, at least I wasn't aware of how, at least in feature films, how you could change time flow. Yeah. So for me to be able to uh, see like, oh man, you can actually take, lift this part and move it over here and just take some images from that part and put it over here. And um you know, it was uh, going to film school for free. Yeah, that I mean, God, it's, a, it's incredible for me, you know, having learned about all this to be, this is the, the period of time and specifically the, the part of filmmaking history I'm most fascinated in is American Zoetrope and all of that. And so to be hearing it, you know, from the mouth of somebody who was there in the middle of it, part of these projects is is mind blowing, you know, and it's really, it's puts it in a lot of perspective because, you know, I'm hearing you talk about write a letter down to these guys, these, these guys, incredible. It's almost reflective of my own anxiety of, Oh, am I going to call this Richard guy in and see if he wants to talk to me? Whereas at the time, you know, you're just, you're, you're, you got to take the shot, you know, and you got to go do it. And you don't know necessarily where it's all going to go where and where these people are going to take I mean, them at that time it's even crazier because Coppola and lucas are just starting out they aren't anybody yet you're just you know a group of guys hanging out in a in a rundown part of san francisco trying to make something into a reality and it's that those are the of the of the moments in life when you realize you're in the middle of them that i always relish the most not the moments where you realize you've made it and you've got it and you finally got the thing you've always wanted but when you're in the middle of working on the things that mean everything to you that that's that are the reason or the drive that gets you up and out of bed every morning i i try to catch those moments when they're happening because you you never know what they become you know at the very least they're always happy memories but you never know what they leave. right but you know it's it's um you know, uh, these experiences, which you don't plan on, uh, yeah. because I was there at the beginning of American Zoetrope, uh, there are many people who came through. Yeah. And one uh, encounter that especially sticks in my mind because it was a cautionary tale was uh, Nicholas Ray was at the kind of the, I guess, the nader. I mean, he was at the end, near the end of his life. And... Um, he had asked Coppola if he could come and finish this, cutting his film that he had shot uh, in prior years with his students in, um, I forget, I think it was, could have been CCNY in New York or, yeah. or some school where he was teaching in New York State and that he had uh, 
assembled all this footage that was in 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, maybe even eight millimeter. And he needed some help uh, uh, to have a space with machines where he could, uh, <laughs> I um, see a tail on a wagon. Um, uh, so, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was wearing an eye patch at that time because of, uh, I don't know what, and he was uh, smoking cigarettes down to the very end because uh, he, was, he was smoking non-filtered cigarettes, you know, oh the camels. And even though I think he was still in his early seventies at that time, but he was really all oh, kind of a grizzled old guy uh, that was asking for favors. And here's this man that has directed some really terrific, you know, film noir kind of films from the forties. Mm -hmm. These yeah. that, that you know, this was in 1973, 1974, that he was asking for favors to be able to work in the editing rooms where uh, Walter and I were working because we were um, using these flatbed editing machines, um, Steenbecks and um, and Kems. Yeah. And he would, uh, um, uh, Nick would come in at night after we left. So he would come in maybe at eight or nine at night. And he would work all night, and then uh, by the next morning he would leave, and we would come in. <laughs> so it was it was really strange because here's a guy whose reputation I knew, but um, to see him up close, to see what, where he was at that time, and then you come in in the morning, and there are boxes of or empty boxes of Chinese food that still smell. <laughs> You know, the eye patch would be hanging on the doorknob. <laughs> oh my God. You know, and it was kind of like when I saw that, I said, boy, do I want to see what he looks like without his eye patch? You know? It was kind of scary. Um, but, you know, uh, so there were people, of course, through the Arthur C. Clarke, a science fiction writer, had come in to pitch something to, to Francis. I, there were all kinds of people coming in. And, That's so wild. Uh, and, it, it was just really an incredible time for me to learn what I did from that experience. What better, what better way to learn, really? It's uh, Yeah, I mean, because like I said, since I hadn't gone to film school, these were the kind of experiences that one needed yeah. in order to expand uh, what I needed to know, especially in editing when you're shaping stuff. It, it wasn't like I was still shooting 16 millimeter yeah. Uh, documentaries in the yeah. yeah, and I always say there's just there's with film there's no no better way to, to learn by doing it. You can spend a decade in the classroom, and if you don't sit in the room and put it together yourself and figure out how it all works together, that classroom time is is completely useless. To the conversation though, I did want to ask also. Uh, are there any specifics that stick out to you? You said you were working pretty much one to one off the script for the the first pass. Uh, are there any specifics that you remember when Walter came in that really changed around the storytelling uh, of that of that narrative? Yeah, there's a, a particular scene toward I guess it was toward the end of the first act, uh, the first forty minutes, where a Gene Hackman. Mm -hmm. Uh, after his assistant, uh, John, played by John Cazell, leaves, that um, Hackman puts together uh, the tape and he realizes he's hearing something that is special, uh, that he would have to use uh, a, a device uh, to clarify what he was hearing. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was a made up device, but it was, you know, it was a prop. It was an empty box because I, when I finally looked at it, it was, I don't know, Francis showed us the box, the prop, and it was an empty box with a knob on it. But Walter was able to design um, a sound effect of how this, the distorted dialogue yeah. and conversation become clear. Wow. And between that, the, the, the sound work of that, and the uh, flashbacks to certain images of the close-ups of the young couple in Union Square speaking, and that to uh, uh, Gene Hackman's uh, realization of what was going on. I mean, you know, for me, it, it was just uh, witnessing firsthand yes. uh, how you can uh, 
impose a certain kind of change in subject the subjectivity of yeah. the actor. And um, in, in that way too, I think editors really have always been at the forefront of the technical innovations uh, in filmmaking because you're the ones that drive the need. You guys are the ones behind the scenes who go, all right, if we're going to make this happen, I need to be able to do X, Y, Z. And, you know, the driving factors behind what special effects need to be created, what sound effects need to be created, you know, not just in the in contained within one piece, but you work on a piece like that. Someone like Walter Murch develops the sound, you know, 40, 50 years down the line, you go into Final Cut uh, Pro and you just have a little tool that fades that out. And, but the people actually, you know, boots on the ground doing it, someone had to invent that, you know, it's, this, it's it's almost doing multiple jobs because you have to be the innovator. You have to be the creator of all these technical uh, pieces. Uh, editing to me is really the job in film that bridges uh, the technical elements of filmmaking and the creative elements because it's it's as technical as it is creative. And you really need to be very professional, have an incredible understanding of both sides of that uh, of that picture when you come when it comes to filmmaking. So we have to remember this is during a town a, a time where it was really handcrafted almost. Yeah. And, and there's and no rule, there were no yeah. handling uh the soundtrack, um, and, and you're actually physically cutting yeah. this material. Uh one incident I remember uh when uh Francis uh was free one night, I guess I don't know, because he was still working on the uh, script for Godfather Two yeah. while we were editing. And uh, he, I think he got impatient with something that I was doing. And he asked me to uh, leave up on a, the steam deck um, a, a reel of, of the scene, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the soundtrack, because he was going to do some cutting on it. Oh, okay. And um, so, uh, which I did. And then the next morning when I came in, I saw kind of scattered on the, the, the top of the editing machine a bunch of one and two frame uh, trims, you know, both <laughs> picture and track, just kind of, kind of littered, you know, on top of the editing machine. Like he's, you know, he started getting frustrated that he was trying to trim something, and then he did, it didn't work out, and he just kind of left them all there, kind of in a pile. Oh my god! And, uh, that's when I realized that oh well, you know, directors should not be handling all this stuff because they're not editors. They yeah. need editors. Exactly. There's a reason for that. How many times in history do you think it's happened that a director has shoulder to side an editor because they knew what they wanted and then discovered quickly that they had no idea how to do any of the things they thought they were trying to do? Well, I have worked with some of those, but then actually <laughs> my second film, uh, which I'll segue into, uh, the next job I got uh, was on uh, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. And I did, uh, you know, with that director, Neil Schwarman, I did learn a whole bunch of completely new things that were so different from what I learned from working on the conversation. Yeah. And I wasn't the sole editor of uh, on Cooper's Nest either. There was Lindsay Klingman and there was Sheldon Kahn. But I was the lead editor and I spent a lot more time with uh, Neil Schwarman editing. Mm -hmm. And um, actually he did... I mean, there's a famous picture of him <laughs> kind of reaching over the Kim in front of me because he wanted it to stop at a precise frame. So, I mean, he, he didn't, he, didn't uh, he, he knew when to start and stop, but mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't deign to actually doing the physical work itself. But, yeah. um, but from him, what I learned was some things that I did not fully appreciate when I was shooting documentaries. Mm -hmm. And if, if you uh, were to review One Food for the Cuckoo's Nest today, you can see how integral um, the use of reaction shots is mm -hmm. uh, in terms of advancing each character's development. Yeah. Because group therapy sessions, basically it's driven by the dialogue between uh, Randall McMurphy, played by Jack Nicholson, yep. and uh, uh, Nurse Ratchet, played by Louise Fletcher. And the other guys who are the patients uh, were merely reacting uh, mm -hmm. to what was being said or done. But you needed those in essence because yeah. the character contributed toward the climax of the picture. Yeah. And if you didn't have them engaged, yeah. uh, 
and learn about them actually just from their reactions and not from their dialogue. So, um, you know, uh, for me, working back in the Cinema Verite kind of days, at least with the people I was working with, reaction shots or we used shots where people weren't speaking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really was bridges to cover up jump cuts because yep. the kind of aesthetic that I kind of grew up in in the late 60s was, you know, jump cuts were kind of uh, not desired. You don't want to see someone speaking and then there'll be a jump and then they're still speaking again, but they're in a different mood or something like that. So you mm -hmm. would cut to a reaction shot to bridge that. Yeah. But I learned from working on Cuckoo's Nest with Milos that um, they you can use them uh, you know, to further story and character development. Yeah. And what an amazing thing, you know, because there's not, I, I didn't, hadn't read anything about how to do that, but it was there in the year that I worked with him, um, yeah. how to use reactions to further the story. Yeah. And I, I, of course, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't appreciate any of the stuff that I was learning until years later when I was kind of, uh, working as the sole editor on, yeah. on print films. But this was really my training period, even though I resisted a lot of it because I was <laughs> kind of too, I don't know, naive uh, to realize that this was like a, a, you know, a pass for me to go to Milos Forman Film School. What was the hardest part in, you know, working on those, those movies, you know, especially something like Cuckoo's Nest, which sounds like it's a little more, the conversation was more sort of, you stepped in to do this and, and got to learn a lot from Walter Murch in the, in the process. And then Cuckoo's Nest, you know, you're, you're picking up new things, but you're also supervising. So what were the, what were some of the, th the biggest strides you made in that time in your, uh, in terms of your own work? And then what were the things, the biggest roadblocks that you were still working through during that process? Well, probably, uh, <laughs> you know, being a young editor at the time, probably my biggest roadblock was my ego. Because I, just, I find that a lot of editors feel like, uh, hey, this is my cut, man. You know, <laughs> what's wrong yep. with it? You know, <laughs> it's perfect. Don't yep. fuck with it, you know? <laughs> yep. You don't need the director. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I would say kind of my pride was, mm. was an obstacle. And, mm. um, and, and because of also the pressure of time, you know, uh. Uh, you don't realize that, I mean, the director has one goal in mind, and then kind of my goal was trying to protect my work or something like that. I was just kind of kind of young and stupid, you know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting because I think it's something that I always go back to, and I think there's a reason I harp on film being a collaborative process and everybody, you know, being responsible for their roles and, and helping because... I'm, I understand that very, I'm, my tendency is that same thing, the ego, the, the being precious about my stuff. And that was such a great lesson for me uh, in the work I've done in film so far. And that, you know, it's going to help me continue to be a better collaborator is, are those things are the point where you have to just, you know, pry your fingers off. That's something we'll get to in the later section, uh, later sections as well is a little more about that and how cinema has changed now because we are in a landscape where it's less, you know, this, the editor and the editor knows the stuff and the director and that we're in the era of everybody wants to be a celebrity. The directors want to be celebrities. The producers want to be celebrities. And so the ego gets gets brought into the creative room even more. Uh, but it really, it's, it's incredible I'm hearing you talk about it and it's there's there's only so much room you know you're all young working people trying to get a project done and ego still comes into play do you realize that being the case there isn't room when you get to these you know when you're loftier goals bigger personalities and stuff there isn't room for those egos and when they start to come into the picture they end up edging out everybody else uh, and that's what I just, you know, to take a moment then, was that something that's, that changed over time as you, as you worked, uh, compared to your time at American Zoetrope, how, how was the collaborative element? Was it more, uh, everyone kind of was treated on a, a more equal playing field or was it more sort of up the food chain than, than it is, than it was working through later? Well, I, I, you know, it really, um, I think it, it depends 
on the personalities involved and uh, um, the amount of money that's involved. <laughs> uh, for sure, uh, in my documentary days, there was less ego involved and there was more collaboration. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I got into features, especially, I guess, the, the, the couple that I worked in, in in the San Francisco Bay Area, the conversation, one through the Cooper's Nest and Star Wars, um, you know, the director had a bigger responsibility and then the, the bigger their personality, yeah. um, you know, the more control that they would insist on mm -hmm. because that's how it went. I mean, you, you know, when I was working in documentaries, there are people like more my age and they didn't really do, had accomplished anything more than me, you know, but by the time I got to work with um, a Coppola or um, a Milos or mm -hmm. a George Lucas, they had made several films, really good films. So yeah. of course, you know, um, I'm there to work for them. I wasn't there just to be a collaborator, at least in those instances. I mean, yeah. it, it was give and take. I mean, you know, a lot of it, it it's not like, you know, uh, Nilo dumped everything I would do. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I remember one instance um, where, I, you know, directors like to have their friends, other directors, come in and look at what they're doing just to kind of show off, right? <laughs> hey, look at my cool movie. Yeah, exactly. And um, I remember I was editing the scene in Cuckoo's Nest where the, uh, the patients were uh, being taken out uh, on a fishing trip uh, to go out to the, um, the sea. And I had insisted on uh, cutting to a point of view shot of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Just because my feeling was, let's show how wide this expanse is. It's an open space because we've been inside with these patients in a hospital room for what, uh, an hour and 20 minutes. And now yeah. when they come out, let's give the feeling of the yeah. exhilaration in this field. And, and Milos, who, like I was saying, he was always interested in the faces of people and their reaction, the characters. And he, he, um, he didn't like my idea and he would say, take that out. And I would say, you know, I said, no, you really need that. Well, it just so happened that day, um, Werner Herzog came by for lunch to, to visit uh, with uh, um, uh, Milos. And, you know, Milos would say, oh, well, hey, let's show him my version, show him your version. So I showed him the two versions, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Herzog really liked what well, didn't really like, but he preferred the version that had the point of view of the ocean because mm -hmm. of course he did. So I felt like, ha, ah, you know. Uh, so that, that was Dude, so it's to show you how subjective it all is. That just made my day because Werner Herzog is one of my other favorite, just he's probably one of my favorite people in general, beyond just his filmmaking and personality and all I listen to his interviews to get inspiration when I need to do improv shows because he I could I do a Werner Herzog impression it's my favorite character to do and so to hear that like that now that now knowing that Werner Herzog is the reason that your cut your your version was the preferred version it's it, was just, it was like one shot <laughs> your your shot your choice your yeah. choice in that moment but it, it yeah. tracks though because of course Werner Herzog would make that based on everything I've seen of his work as a filmmaker that's exactly his of course he's going to go for the big visual metaphor naturally oh I love that that might have been the great greatest story I've ever heard that just made my day <laughs> I love that so much Oh man, I uh, I wanted to double back before we jump into our next big film. Obviously, we're gonna spend some time on that because this guy, gentleman, that appeared in both. Uh, I just had a realization with you talking about that I never thought of before, which is you're editing this first pass on the conversation before Gra American Graffiti comes out, and you're telling me they're still working on that over there. So your very first time ever seeing Harrison Ford as an actor is in the rough cuts, you know, in in the dailies. No, sorry, you you made the rough guy. Is the dailies from the conversation? So, what can you speak a little bit to that? You know, as I you've mentioned certain things before about how he comes across and and what that is like looking at, you know, look seeing somebody pop off of the, of the screen or seeing somebody affect you in a certain way on screen and then tracing their 
their trajectory. So before we jump into Star Wars, even maybe to segue in, like, what was that like seeing him, you know, this guy pop into into frame for the first time uh, in your work on the conversation and then have him come back into the picture when you uh, jump into uh, into Star Wars with Harrison Ford. So. Well, you know, uh, when you are working in, in films and seeing young actors, there's a lot of young actors. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good looking people, young, old, and, and who knows what's gonna happen with them. Actually, you know, I had seen him in uh, uh, in American Graffiti, when oh, yeah. Walter and and, um, and George were working on that, okay. and so he was just kind of a young, good-looking guy that was funny, you know. But he didn't, uh, for me, he didn't stand out any more than uh, Paul Matt or Ron Howard or any of these younger people because they're all kind of smart, alecky kids, except for the Ron Howard character, you know, yeah. on the street uh, driving their cars, and then in the conversation. You know, uh, I think one of the people that was really instrumental in uh, having spotted the talent of, uh, of Harrison Ford and getting him cast in those films coming out of the Zoetrope uh, mm -hmm. was Fred Bruce, who uh, has frequently gotten uh, producer credit on the Coppola pictures. And mm -hmm. as a, he was really a casting director that spotted people like Harrison Ford, Cindy Williams. Oh, um, yeah. Fred Forrest, you know, in the conversation. Yeah. So, so he got, you know, uh, he suggested and brought in uh, Harrison Ford as the assistant to the Robert Duvall character in, yeah. in uh, the conversation. And, you know, um, I got to meet him along with, you know, Walter and I went with Harrison to uh, do some looping because mm -hmm. as we cut some of the picture, we needed him to do some lines and I forget which ones. But, you know, he at that time, uh, on the side, he was working as a Finnish carpenter. Mm -hmm. And so he was, you know, I remember we were at Paramount walking across the lot, and he was uh, kind of uh, talking about some project. I think he was installing some bathroom cabinets or something <laughs> in some, some other celebrity's home in Malibu. And he was talking about he hopes that the uh, looping session uh, won't be too long because of the traffic. He had to get back out to finish the job, oh you know. So here it is, and I just thought, you know, he's a, he's a, you know, a friendly young actor that mm -hmm. had a gig as a carpenter, and who knows if I would ever see him again. <laughs> so, um, uh, because of I think uh, uh, that he did really a good job on American Graffiti, and because of, I think Fred Roos's influence. Uh, yeah. He helped, you know, uh, bring him into Star Wars, and yeah. you know, it, it's uh, so much of casting. You, you just don't know how it catches on with an audience. It, yeah. it could have been a flop, you know. Right. Uh, so we don't. I mean, the whole movie could have been a flop. I mean, we don't know, you know. I mean, those are the those are the crazy things. That's the crazy things we always hear. You know, us fanatics reading about Star Wars is how it really was one of those projects where. Uh, every you know, a happy accident, every little thing sort of had to trip into each other in the right way at the right time. Like if certain, if a certain person wasn't there at the right time, at the right place, the whole thing was going to fall apart. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, the editing room was, is, is well known as that was one of the biggest uh, problem places in the film that needed to be addressed. And, and so certainly your name has gone down repeatedly in those conversations as one of those key pieces that without whom this movie would not have been pulled off. Uh, so when, in, when in the editing process, did you come onto that project? Were you in that, were you in it from the get go or did you come in after it had already been addressed a little bit? Oh, uh, we talking about which picture? For Star Wars. Wars? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Well, um, I was not uh, in on it at the beginning. Um, George um, was shooting in England, and his budget didn't allow, uh, you know, to bring people from stateside unless you were one of the actors there. Yep. So uh, his original editor uh, was uh, John Jimson, who had cut uh, A Hard Day's Night. And, you know, in the mid-60s, uh, Hard Day's Night was really kind of a, a cult favorite, and everybody loved it. And, uh, you know, when George got to England, uh, you know, if you look at although people he hired as his department heads, they were like the primo of English, you know, studio films mm. from um, 
the, the, the DP whose name I can't remember right now. Do you remember the name of the DP? I, I don't off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was a, some you know super cameraman. And John Jimson was uh, the editor that uh, George thought you know would bring uh, a special personality to the, the cut. Yeah. But you know, George had really a miserable time working with his English crew because none of them got it. So yeah. when he Return to America, he realized because of the time pressure of, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of uh, getting the picture out for 20th Century Fox. Um, so he got, um, he hired first uh, his wife, uh, Marsha Lucas. And, and, and Marsha thought, oh, we, we're going to need at least one other editor. So uh, George wasn't about to bring John Jimson over because. You know, he wanted to bring people that could just kind of live near where he lived in his new studio in San Rafael, California, uh, which for those of you that don't know, that's north of San Francisco, but it's still part of the Bay Area. Yeah. And um, so I was brought in to undo uh, what John Jimson had done up to that time, because Marsha was supposed to work with George on the last two reels of picture, the last 20 minutes of picture, yep. uh, they asked me to work on the, you know, the beginning. So yep. I, I, you know, at that time, because, um, you know, how when you're working on film, everything is printed onto a work print and it's expensive to reprint things. Yeah. So uh, I had to have, you know, uh, I had to look at, you know, what had been done mm -hmm. and then have a, a staff of assistants take everything apart, take every splice apart, wow. take all the tape off, reconstitute it into the original shots on wow. these daily shows, and then I would start all over again. Oh my gosh. Which, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard to work that way because then you're working with material that have a lot of splices and tape yeah. over it, and then in undoing the old splices, uh, when those, when the tape was taken off of the old splices, some of the uh, emotion, the film emotion, would mm -hmm. come off too. So that's what we used to call greenies, because mm -hmm. that's the lowest layer of color emotion on um, uh, the work. Yeah. So you, you can see these little green stripes and blotches at either the top or the bottom of the frame that goes yeah. through, that tells you that there used to be a cut there. Uh. <laughs> so it was, you know, it, uh, it was, I, I don't think that um, John Jimson understood what George really wanted because it was cut very conventionally, like yeah. I was saying, kind of based on the script, there's a master shot, there's a crew shot, there's an over the shoulder, you know, so it just kind of didn't have any uh, kind of dynamics to it or excitement. Yeah. To. Whose idea uh, were all the transitions doing like the wipes and the, the, like those different types of transitions? Who's, who's, did that come from George? Did that come from one of you guys? Who's had well, that? I, well, I remember having a discussion about that early on with him. Uh, I mean, you know, you, know, you have to uh, recall that this was in 1976. So how many mm -hmm. years ago? 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I did recall uh, in my mind because when I first saw the dailies, uh, mm -hmm. because he said, you know, have your assistants reconstitute this, look at the stuff, and then we'll have to figure this out. And um, one thing that really impressed me, of course, uh, when looking at the dailies were uh, the costumes, the wardrobe. I mean, I saw, you know, Darth Vader or the Stormtroopers, and kind of like, whoa, this is really cool. But the thing that really struck me also in the sets, how the doors, would uh, move from side to side. Yeah. And um, I remember discussing with him, and I don't know, he may have had these discussions with, uh, with Marsha Lucas prior, but I remember you know, suggesting to him that instead of uh, the normal dissolve or something like that, I said, wouldn't that be kind of cool? Because I knew that um, he was influenced by Buck Rogers yeah, yeah. Uh, things that I remember seeing as a kid too on television in the, in the 50s. And uh, they did use those wipes. Yeah. Uh, 
So I remember talking to him about it. I said, hey, wouldn't it be really cool to do that? Because, you know, um, there's a chart that optical houses put out. And it used to be that there's a, it, it's a black and white it's in black and white, and it shows you kind of in the frames with um, all the different kind of uh, scene transitions that the, mm -hmm. that the optical house could do. And, yeah. you know, lo and behold, if you look at the sheet of paper, that was one thing that hadn't been used in such a while, but <laughs> used to use 25 years prior yeah. to that. Awesome. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that um, anything, any idea that might have been uh, mentioned in passing or even as a joke, um, you know, was absorbed into uh, George's head, and, and anyway, <laughs> I it's not like I'm instrumental on it. I but I remember well, talking about it with him. That's great. I mean, that's perfect. It's, it's awesome to ask such a specific question and get such a specific answer. I mean, that's phenomenal. Uh, so in that in that token, so you're working on this this you know pulling apart and redoing of Act One. Uh, Marsha is concurrently working on putting together uh, the other two acts. So where is George's focus on this? Is, are you, do you guys come together at any point to work on this together or is it more like you're each doing your own pieces and sort of put it all together at the end? Oh, before I answer that uh, question and remind me to come back to it, I just want to mention one other thing that I learned from taking apart John Jimson's cut. Yeah. Because prior to uh, seeing what he did, was especially when you're working with film and you have dialogue, you cut the soundtrack in the same frame that you would cut the picture. Mm -hmm. So what you would have is a straight across cut. And um, I didn't realize because I hadn't gone to film school that when I looked at John Jimson's cut, that his sound would always extend across the cut, across the picture, four frames or so. In, before he began the dialogue of the next scene. And um, I realized when I was playing it back that that really helped with the flow of a cut because the soundtrack did not change yeah. um, on the same frame that the picture changed. So if the, the sound continued on uh, four frames, that's what he usually used, uh, four frames into the sound of the next one that it made the picture cut seem smoother because the sound carried across that cut. That's such a cool way to learn that. I, I... Yeah, because, you know, a lot of times what happens when you're cutting uh, dialogue is that the background behind yeah. the dialogue uh, is at a different level than maybe the oncoming, incoming uh, uh, dialogue because of I don't know, whatever, the traffic or whatever. So yeah. uh, this is a way to smooth it out. Yeah. But especially when you're cutting in film, you're only carrying one track. You're not cutting multiple tracks. You know, yeah. To, because it's just too much to be manipulating all of that. Whereas I, digitally you can, but in, in exactly. the uh, manual days, you know, um, we had to do that. Exactly. I even remember learning about things like room tone for the first time, you know, 30 seconds at the end of every scene, get the sounds, ambient sounds in the room to do exactly that. So if a couple of your takes, or maybe you have to go do some ADR later and, you know, it's recorded in a completely different environment, you want to have some continuity, otherwise it messes that up. And I remember the very first time ever editing and dealing with not having good sound continuity and thinking I will never not get good room tone ever again because <laughs> it really messes up everything. If you're one person's talking here and the other person's talking here and the background change changes completely, it's very jarring and it really takes you out of the uh, the the moment. I mean, I've even there's a famous study that uh, a bunch they showed a bunch of people the same quality footage. They showed it with one with a really good sound quality soundtrack and one with a lesser quality soundtrack, the people responded saying that the footage looked lesser quality. They didn't know it was the same. They responded all saying the one with the worst sound looked worse. And that was really eye opening for me at how important sound is in your production, how critical it is. If you can, you can actually cut corners with picture more than with sound. That's something that I've advised up and coming filmmakers repeatedly. <laughs> Right, the, uh, a good soundtrack uh, uh, designed and mixed yeah. imparts so much more production value to, you can even use the footage off your iPhone 
But exactly. if you have a really uh, professionally done, not even professionally, but just imaginatively designed soundtrack, yeah. it just kind of, it expands that world. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of strange of how the, the trick that your mind plays on it, because I've been watching uh, uh, movies uh, at home with my headsets on, you know, rather than being in a the theater, I'll put on a headset to be able to hear better the, yeah. the design of the whole thing. And it's tricky that even though you have a headset on and all the sound is in here, but somehow what I'm hearing here sounds like it's really coming from your mind plays that trick on you. Yeah, yeah, it's it really is a powerful tool. Uh, and this one it then answered part two of your question about uh, editing because there's a third editor that uh, George hired, that's Paul Kirsch, who came in from yeah. New York. Uh, we had to, I think by this time, I didn't come on to pitch until they returned from England, which was in mm -hmm. June, I believe, in 1976. Mm -hmm. And George was committed to showing a cut uh, in November to uh, the studio executives. And he still hadn't produced any of the visual effects. Mm, wow. So by this time, I believe it was August uh, or even September mm. that uh, uh, George brought in uh, Paul Hirsch. So there were three of us working and we were getting each other's uh, uh, material. Because <laughs> George wasn't there uh, the entire week. He would spend maybe three days, uh, the first three days of the week uh, in Van Nuys, California, where if, uh, original ILM yep. uh, was uh, renting um, warehouse space out in uh, Van Nuys. About five minutes up the road from where we live right now, actually. Um, yeah, so, you know, all the, the camera equipment uh, was all being designed by John Dykstra and his crew. So uh, um, George was working down there with them to try to just manufacture something. And then he would come back up and then he would work with us maybe uh, the other three days of the week. Yeah. So, you know, it was really kind of, I wouldn't say chaotic, but there was a lot of work to do. And that's why we were trading stuff back and forth. And yeah. we were kind of our, our best collaborators amongst ourselves because he wasn't there uh, mm -hmm. half the time. And so when he was there, did he have a very strong vision that he wanted to impart or did he kind of, was he at a point where with all the other moving pieces, he just sort of trusted you guys and then would course correct when he felt it was necessary? Yeah, I was more like a course correction. I mean, because, you know, I, I, one of the first, I, 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 yeah, one of the first um, sequences that he assigned to me was uh, what we called the gunport sequence. And that movie is where, uh, uh, Han Solo and, and the crew was escaping from the Death Star. Yep. So they, they get into the uh, Millennium Falcon and they were then shooting at the TIE fighters that were coming in. So yep. um, when, I, when he was giving me that to work on, it was all a green screen uh, <laughs> where, uh, let's see, uh, Leia and Chewbacca were in the cockpit and when mm -hmm. they were looking up, there behind him was just green screen. And then with Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill in their run turrets, it was just green screen. Yeah. And all they were doing is just kind of looking from here to there at George's direction. Look up to the right, look up to the left, you know, spin around. So you, you hear these directions and uh, kind of between the lines that they're throwing at each other. And mm -hmm. so George says, you know, um, here, I'm going to show you, this is the famous thing that you read about, everybody talks about, is this montage that George had put together in 16 millimeter mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, black and white footage of dog fights uh, from World War II. Mm -hmm. So he found this newsreel stuff of uh, American fighters, Japanese fighters, German fighters, and they're all kind of flying and crisscrossing the sky and we were shooting back and forth. And you know, he said, this is an example of what I would like to see mm -hmm. uh, the, the benefit sequence. And, you know, here it is. I'm coming out of not action pictures. Mm -hmm. I come out of 
you know, something was trying to, uh, like in the conversation, it's kind of a mystery of trying yeah. to solve something. Or in Cuckoo's Nest, it was more a performance piece yeah. of real yeah. people reacting in real time. And there was no action there except for, I don't even know. But <laughs> yeah, uh, I was so I was just working on eye movement, you know, of directing the eye of where um, Mark was going to be. And I realized that if you're going to turn this way, that cutting to a point of view, which was just <clears throat> his point of view with the green screen, was going to be something. Mm -hmm. So uh, not knowing that that uh, 16 frames, which uh -huh. was two times a second, was going to have something in it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, it, was, it, it was pretty crazy to put together stuff like that yeah. that had blanks, basically, blanks in between what uh, work print I was working with of the, the real actors. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, he would just say, make that longer, make that shorter, because he wanted um, to, to create something that had yet been created yeah. to, you know, <laughs> to abridge that gap. So he's actually <laughs> doing so he's probably sitting there going, running in his head how long he thinks it's going to take for the shot of the TIE Flyers, TIE Fighters to fly by. Uh, oh, I think you need a couple more seconds there. It's all this very, very theoretical uh, cutting in a way. That's yeah, so yeah, it was. But, you know, the big thing that I learned from that, you know, to talk about the kind of the film school education I got in my first five, six years of working in feature films was... Marsha, I was assigned to uh, cut the, uh, the, the scene of Darth Vader making his uh, appearance in the film, where the, uh, the his army, the stormtroopers, would break through uh, yeah. into the, the spaceship, and, and then he would come. Up. And uh, the, the footage was very limited because, I mean, George, working with a limited budget, would have, say, for instance, in that sequence, he would have, he would shoot two takes at the most. And, and each take, he would move the camera for a different composition. So he would essentially end up with maybe four angles mm -hmm. of a particular, you know, uh, setup. Not a setup, but a, of that scene. Yeah. So we're quite limited. So you have the, the, the stuff looking from behind the, mm -hmm. the Rebel defenders at the door, and then a reverse from the point of view of the stormtroopers and Darth Vader coming in toward uh, the storm, uh, the rebel fighters. Yeah. So um, it, it was limited to begin with, and um, and and the way that the script had been written, uh, the the robots uh, uh, C three PO and R two D two were in separate scenes, but you know. I learned from Marsha the value of cross-cutting, which I didn't know about either. <laughs> I, and how, you know, if you uh, blend together this, uh, the several different scenes, you're upping the tension between all these different characters and you're putting them into the mix yeah. of their uh, jeopardy. Yeah, I mean- so it That was like a whole, you know, other thing that was like, wow, yeah. you can do that too. I mean, not only are you, I mean, you're contributing to the linear narrative, mm -hmm. uh, but in the cross cutting, you're creating the tension and involving more characters. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, that was another uh, thing that I didn't know about because that wasn't in the script either. So, parlaying on that, a few months later, I realized that in uh, George working with Marshall about the last 10 minutes or last five minutes of the run down to, uh, you know, into yeah. the death start to blow it up, uh -huh. that it occurred to me that what we had done with the beginning should be applied there at the end because the way mm -hmm. that it was written and shot, mm -hmm. there was no jeopardy for Princess Leia and the defenders of... Uh, the, the, the rebels because yeah. that had taken place uh, as it was shot, written and shot, and mm -hmm. then Luke was making the run uh, mm -hmm. down the trough to blow it up. Mm -hmm. So I do remember that conversation, yeah. although maybe that 
was in George's mind, but I did discuss with him like, hey, you know what we did in the beginning, maybe you guys can be doing that at the end by mm -hmm. intercutting stuff because you could do it because the dialogue that you could add could be off screen, you know, on Princess Leia and her generals, you could add all the stuff of how close, you know, the, <clears throat> the other guys, you know, yeah. were coming to, to blow you up and to, you know, to kill you guys. And because you don't um, have to um, uh, have any sync dialogue, you know, for that, because there wasn't any, because they were merely running around, uh, the, those characters were just running around from like table to computer screen. So a lot of that stuff, if you look at it, and probably this has been discussed by a lot of other people, is that none of that dialogue, you know, was actually on camera. Mm -hmm. It was all the was created by what was being announced from off screen. That's so, really fascinating. That's something I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I realized how, you know, that, that, that was such a, a point. First of all, it's fascinating that this concept that is new to you, that these guys are teaching you how to implement, you then bring back and suggest to them to, to do at the end. So there's that fun feedback loop, but uh, it's, it's really, because that does make that scene. I mean, that's that bad, that adds all of the tension in that scene is seeing Leia's concerned face. Uh, when all this is going down, yeah, other than that, I think you you would lose a lot from that of just sitting in the cockpits, sitting you know with the the fighters the whole time, following that. Oh, everything's down here and everything's up there. It really would flatten out that entire scene completely. You would lose all of the. Well, I mean, Jeff watches that scene. That's one of his favorite scenes in in, in cinema. And he'll put it on just on a whim as a pick me up because it always. No matter what, no matter how many times he's watched, no matter how intimately he knows every detail, the way it's all, the way that scene flows, it builds the tension every single time, no matter how many times you experience it. It's so, awesome. yeah, in, yeah. So in fairness to everybody involved, you know, when you get a uh, few different editors along with George Lucas, who's an editor really himself, but he didn't really touch the film the same way that we manipulated. Um, it shows you the collaboration about because you know my uh, Marsha and I we work uh, on the film until Christmas uh, this Christmas break and then they're um, oh oh so <laughs> I'm I'm getting ahead of myself uh, the 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 uh, we did show it to the studio uh, mm -hmm. Alan Ladd Jr. who they called Laddie uh, saw it in I believe November and we had in um, a temporary soundtrack music track. And what was, uh, you know, for any of you who work in, in, in pictures, you know that you have to put in temporary soundtrack uh, because you got to help uh, uh, uninitiated uh, uh, audiences as to what you intend the feeling yeah. to be here. So, um, you know, George had um, uh, used, he had us use uh, Holtz's um, Planets the, as a temporary soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And as an example, uh, the movement that is called Mars has done, you know, has those beats. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, no, I'm not doing it right. Uh, but anyway, it's very ominous. And yeah. uh, that to build up to the breakthrough of, uh, of the Stone Troopers of Darth Vader coming in. And uh, so we used a lot of um, uh, Holtz. And then Dvorak, for instance, for the New yeah. World Symphony for the end. So uh, when we first showed it to the studio, that's the kind of um, a temporary a music that we used. Um, <coughs> that makes a lot of sense. I'm sorry. I said that makes a lot of sense. It. it yeah. 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 Um, so uh, but, you know, uh, Paul Hirsch. Uh, well, the the budget was really being diverted toward like. Let's, let's get these, um, uh, uh, what, uh, get these shots in so that, you know, get, get the, the, act, what, the, the, the active scenes in, get that finished so that we can spend the rest of the money on creating all the visual stuff. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, so, you know, the, 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 so Marsha and I left at, the, at Christmas time 
and Paul Hurst continued to refine the picture with George, as uh, you know, Paul can you know, talks about a lot, even in his book, talking about all the finishing work that he that he did with George. But one thing I, I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, you know, to show you how handcrafted uh, my work on Star Wars was, was in my last week or so in working on it, uh, George said that the people at ILM needed a template uh, to, uh, for them to animate in all the laser shots or the, the laser, sh the shooting between all the different, uh, you know, characters on the screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, at that time, you know, we used grease pencils, white grease pencils to make marks on the, um, or the, the work print to indicate things. So for instance, on a fade, you know, you would draw lines to show that it's a fade out or it's a dissolve or a wipe or whatever it is. And you use grease pencils. Yeah. And, um, so he asked me, to uh, why don't you indicate on these um, gun sequence, these gun battle sequences, use a grease pencil to kind of mark where uh, the shots were, you know, who was shooting from what guns and in what direction, you know, these shots, these laser shots were going. And then when you cut to the reverse, mm -hmm. where is that shot going to be coming from? So you know, you might have like, two stormtroopers shooting this way and the you know, I would use a, with a grease pencil with direction, and then when it cuts to the reverse, when you would see, see, see Han or Princess Leia getting shot at, you would see these shots coming back in. So it was really painstaking to put all this stuff in. And of course, grease pencils um, leave residue. So because the film is being wound around each other, the residue would then end up sticking to the back side of... Uh, um, of the film, you know, from like a uh, second or so before. So when I would run this through the Kim for George, it became this kind of splotchy, you know, bunch of mark of grease pencils across the screen, kind of going this way and that way. It was oh my God. Really crazy to watch. Oh, probably that sounds insane. <laughs> That's it, 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 it was. That it just must have been. Were there were there any points where on any of the projects you worked on uh, through this period where you ever thought like it's not going to get done or you just couldn't do what was being asked of you or any moments where you know ah it just it just can't be done or we're not going to make it. Uh well yes yeah, especially, well, especially in Star Wars because I wasn't there until the end. Yeah. And and. I mean, you know, I had seen very little by the time I left in December of 1976 of, uh, I had seen very little of what was being created, uh, you know, by ILM. I mean, I had seen some of, you know, what the TIE fighters would look like and stuff yeah. like that. But uh, some of the scenes hadn't even been shot like the, uh, the land speeder <laughs> across the desert. Yeah. That had been shot. So, you know, what you would see are uh, um, wheels <laughs> instead of, you know, the, the actual, you know, land speeder going across. Um, yes. And some of that stuff was done, you know, by second unit later. But yeah. um, so I, I, you know, that, you know, was such a huge undertaking that who knows, because it was so dependent on so many different. Uh, collaborators, uh, you know, from sound effects. I mean, like Ben Burt, you know, is creating all, all this stuff out basically in his editing room uh, using uh, just a tape recorder. And, you know, he was doing just fantastic stuff that I had heard of. He would need of the Nigra uh, recorder uh, in order to play back uh, certain sound effects for like say Chewbacca's sound. And um, uh, then he would layer that on top of other things. And, you know, between that, the uh, and the sounds he was creating for R2-D2 uh, and the, uh, and, you know, he was, I think that was one of his, well, I know it was one of his early jobs, you know, out of mm -hmm. film school. So between that 
and what was being created 400 miles away at IOM. It was, you know, uh, I had no idea, you know, how George would be able to, you know, make it all come off. Yeah. So when you saw the finished well, product, the piece too that you know who knows whether there's an audience you know out there for this because at a certain cynical moment I remember making a crack to George I said well hey if the movie doesn't work out you can make some toys out of these guys and you know maybe you can merchandise some of them uh, little did I know little uh, did I know that he had a contract early on with the studio even before he shot the picture that he had mm -hmm. merchandise rights he and, knew that. Uh, you know, so he was so far ahead of, you know, at least my little thinking, you know, by making a little crack to try to reduce this gigantic film and hey, George, maybe you can make some toys out of this. But, well, he definitely uh, did that. He was, he was That's crazy. Now, was there anything in that one in particular since, you know, there was so there were so many changes that happened since you were t you touched it to its its final iteration. Were there any big surprises? Uh, when you saw the finished piece, uh, uh, good, bad, whatever, just different, any big changes either to the, the cutting itself, or the, the narrative, uh, or just the way it changed having all the effects and the John Williams score and all that. What was that experience like, you know, seeing this, this finished product that you had been such an in integral part of? Yeah, when I was in, uh, when I got to see finally the finished film for the first time in May of uh, 1977, mm -hmm. uh, I I was knocked out by the opening um, spaceship <laughs> coming in from the top of the screen and the duration of it for how <laughs> big it was. Yeah. I, mean, I hadn't seen that in December of the prior year. Mm -hmm. So between, you know, the, the crawl and the, the, with the opening titles and to the, uh, the spaceship coming in, chasing, of course. Well, actually, it, you see you know, the rebels running away and then the best spaceship. Yeah. That was when I realized with that audience, it, it was a, I forgot where the audience was recruited, but it was actually in a theater uh -huh. in San Rafael. And mm -hmm. the audience stood up and cheered. I, it was, I, I had never, you know, worked on a movie that had an audience that rose up to their feet and wow. cheered in that because these were obviously people people that are looking forward to it, you know, and there's like mm -hmm. one of the first um, uh, public viewings of the completed film. Yeah, that's incredible. Wow, that's, that must have been just so magical too. That Those are the things that always blow my mind with movie making is no matter what part you're on and unless you're actually the people, I mean, even if you're the people rendering the special effects and whatnot, you're rarely seeing the completed piece. You're just sending it off to someone to plug back in. So on a picture like a Star Wars or something with a lot of action and visual effects, uh, how nobody outside of the directors and producers are tracking the entire process really see the final cut until it's done. And what a, what a difference that must have been. Like you said, you know, coming from supervising Cuckoo's Nest where you see pretty much the final product when it's out of your hands, there's not a whole lot of, of changes that happen at that point to something like this where you're, the, the movie doesn't happen without you, but at the same time, you're, you're such a, a specific piece of it and there's so much more that needs to go in. You know, it's really kind of mind-blowing when you look at every piece uh, that went into making that film. Yeah, well, you know, uh, yeah, I, I felt certainly more than in the other two films. In this film, I was just one soldier among a whole company of troops, yep. you know, that had all their specialties, you know, uh, different yep. weapons, well, different weapons to it. Yep, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's everyone has their tools as their weapons, and everyone has their special skills and knows how to use them. That's a it's a great metaphor for it. Uh, and then, of course, subsequently, you know, you ended up taking home a big shiny uh, piece of gold from that. What was it like? I mean, even the whole getting the finding out you were nominated and then finding out, you know, uh, and then you being there and, and accepting the award and all that. And just, you know, uh, this brings up a whole topic about awards. <laughs> you, you know, um, because, you know, <laughs> it's it's very misleading, I would feel, because, you know, to go back in my story, you know, I, I worked in documentaries, uh, 
the the Redwoods, which was the first documentary that I'd shot and edited, had won an Oscar for best short documentary. But I wasn't there, uh, you know, to to receive an Oscar. Anyway, the the uh, the director of that was there. I was in the jungles of Colombia in the Andes, actually, not in the jungles, but in the Andes, uh, shooting that film for the Peace Corps. I mentioned that yeah. was in 1967, 1968. Um, Yes, 1968. And then on one floor of the cuckoo, oh, and then the conversation, although it wasn't nominated for an Oscar, it was nominated for several BAFTAs, the British Academy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was in 1974. Right? So, uh, so it was nominated uh, uh, for editing there. And I didn't, uh, I didn't go to England because no one offered to, uh, to pay my way there. So I didn't go to that. <laughs> it did get nominated and it did win. Um, mm -hmm. an award, an editing award in England. And then one through the Cuckoo's Nest was nominated for an Oscar as well as for a bath after the very next year. And uh, mm -hmm. so I did go to the Oscar ceremony for that, but that was the mm -hmm. year that was really heavy competition that um, I, along with uh, Lindsay Klingman and Sheldon Khan, were there, but we lost to uh, Verna Fields, who uh, won the Oscar for Jaws. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of uh, what uh, used to, you know, working on pictures that, hey, you know, it's nominated for this or that. So mm -hmm. what's a big deal? So yeah. uh, when uh, Star Wars was nominated, uh, of course, uh, you know, I uh, attended that. And I forgot what was up that year in editing. But, you know, it, 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 there was a lot of momentum for that. Yeah. And uh, it was just, I don't know, I, I was still living up in the San Francisco area and kind of a hippie. And it's just been kind of ridiculous for me to have to get on a tuxedo, <laughs> a rent a tuxedo, you know, and get a haircut yeah. and stuff like that, uh, you know, to attend. And, uh, you know, I... It was great. I mean, of course, um, the surprise you feel because you're sitting in this <clears throat> audience and you're waiting for this build up. And then when they finally announce it, you realize that, oh my God, I'm going to have to go up there on stage. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, between the three of us, we had agreed beforehand that Paul Hirsch, since he um, worked on the picture the longest amount of because uh, the Academy staff uh, producers would ask, um, you know, if there are multiple uh, winners, uh, choose one of you to uh, speak. And we mm -hmm. don't want all three of you guys speaking, which people violate all the time. But we were kind of like, you know, we observed the rules. So if we win, Paul, you know, you speak. And he was really a terrific uh, spokesperson for us. So when we're up on stage, um, get, I mean, you know, who was the, who were the presenters? It was a Farrah Fawcett Majors and uh, Marcello Mastriani. It was kind of like, oh my God! I mean, it was like this is for real, you yeah. know, to go up in this. I felt ridiculous in this tux because the boat, the styles at the time. I think I had to rent it like you know the day before. I had to pick it up because I was coming in from San Francisco, you know, to rent this tuxedo that I felt was ridiculous. But anyway, it was just kind of amazing to be up on stage. And this was at the old, old Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Uh, but still, there were balconies. And we just, I think the capacity of the theater were in the thousands for sure. I, yeah. I don't know, 1,000, 3,000, 4,000. But people Something on the that. balconies and all that. And, and these people are applauding. And I forgot what, who had preceded us in Star Wars to win something because of, I forget how many, I think we won five, the picture won five. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when uh, Paul was speaking, I was looking at George in the front row and just kind of holding my Oscar, kind of pointing at him because I knew that he was the guy that was responsible for this, you know? And I yeah. was like you were saying earlier, I was one of the foot soldiers. And mm -hmm. uh, it was unfortunate that he didn't win as director because Woody Allen got it that year for Annie Hall. Oh, yeah. 
But um, you know, George, I mean, he got rewarded in other ways. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it enabled him to go on with the franchise. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, 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 it's a pretty um, intimidating sequence of events because after you do your there on stage and you escort her off stage and you go off stage, go into the press room, and the press room is all full of uh, media people both filming and with uh, tape recorders, you know, throwing questions at you. And it, it's just kind of a blur as to, you know, what happens. Um, yeah. And then, of course, to go to the governor's ball afterwards. And I forgot, I think we had to get in our limo and go somewhere else, if I recall. Or maybe it was in the same site. I, I, it was so long ago. But to be at the uh, at a table with John Williams, who I, who won an Oscar too, and his date that night was uh, Mia Farrow. Oh. So you know, it was kind of like when you go to the Oscars and you're not really a star, but you're kind of you know with stars. And, and Mia Farrow at that time was just one of my favorites. So you know, it was kind of um, the whole experience yeah. was so mind blowing. Wow, that must have been really just really. It, impressive uh, just awesome night to just be in the company of those kinds of people I mean like you say you know I mean you really belong there it's you're doing that level of work but like you say it's a different experience oh you're the stars and uh, I've worked those events in catering back in the day but uh, and I've I've had those moments just you know serving drinks to in that and be like oh it's, it's all those people that I see in the movies that I love watching uh, but then really, I mean, to be there and to be have something in your hand that says, yep, I belong here. This is, I've earned my right to be here. It's really, it's really awesome. Uh, out of curiosity, if you could give yourself the Oscar for any of your, the, the work you've done, would it be for Star Wars? Or is there another piece you feel was more, you know, that ex you extended yourself further or did more, th you know, obviously it's a very subjective question to begin, to begin with, but there it is. If you could give yourself the Academy Award for any of your editing jobs, which one would it be? <laughs> wow. I, I guess I could probably maybe, you know, bifurcate that mm -hmm. answer because I mean, the, the, in my first three films in which I was part of a team. Yeah. In the, my later films, which I did, you know, as the sole editor. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you know, each of the films, like The Conversation, Cooper's Nest, and Star Wars, where I was a member of the team, the pictures were so different, and the challenges were so different, that it, it, that's a hard um, question to answer. Because for me, uh, Cooper's Nest was performance-driven. Yeah. And I thought that that was a harder uh, job to do because you're shaping performance. And of course, you know, what Lofty was about, which was, I would say, much more of a, uh, an action picture. And it, of course, it deserved that uh, just because of the tension that it built. But I would say if I were to trade that around, I felt like, you know, the editing team on Cuckoo's Nest maybe should have gotten an Oscar. Um, you know, and then start uh, uh, the conversation was a wholly different thing because of the kind of yeah. problems that were uh, the creative problems that were, yeah. uh, you know, part of that finishing that picture. So, mm -hmm. I, I, the whole thing about awards, it's just kind of, um, I have really ambivalent feelings about that because mm -hmm. I forgot what actor that said this. Maybe it was Sean Penn or. Jack Nicholson or somebody that was saying like, just to be nominated, we should just kind of let it go at that because yeah. being a winner is kind of like you're running a foot race and it, it, who gets there first. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, it's not about that. It's it's about campaigning or, or popularity, or, you know, what's yeah. in the popular mind as yeah. to, so, you know, maybe because I, haven't really won any Oscars by myself. So in answer to the question, I don't know. I, you know, it, it's hard to say because even the films that I did later, mm -hmm. uh, there were you know, such different um, obstacles in, yep. in finishing the work 
and yeah. in the creative work and then both in the interpersonal relationships. Maybe that's a topic for another discussion as to how to survive, you know, interpersonal yeah. relationships in working on a film because we don't know about those things. I mean, they don't give you awards, you know, for your endurance, <laughs> or maybe they do because I know that in some editors who have worked with certain directors, yeah, lost her because they put up with the fact <laughs> director for the last few years, you know. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to bring us probably to the end of today's uh, discussion. We covered a lot of great ground, incredible, incredible territory in filmmaking. Um, what more can I say that you haven't already? I mean, it's really been such a, such a, again, a gift and a pleasure. All incredible stories about things I expected to hear and things I didn't expect to hear. I mean, that nugget about Werner Herzog really did make my day. So thank you once again, Richard for being here, for donating all of this time, and we'll continue on moving into the next phase of your career, which is of course becoming an independent man. And uh, in terms of editing, being the solo editor on a lot of these projects, uh, having all of the freedoms and control that uh, come with being a, an Oscar winner and a hot commodity moving into the uh, next next phase of your of your career. So I'm really looking forward to diving into that next time and hope everybody's been enjoying watching. Once again, thank you, Richard, and until next time, God Empress out. Have a good day.